Welcome to a new cardiac imaging Agora session. I would like to thank the Cleveland Clinic Cardiology Graphic Team because they performed a wonderful job. We have a new logo, so thank you very much for all your help and all your great efforts. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, now we can start with the uh, new session. This new session is dedicated on how to read a positive stress myocardial perfusion scan, uh, including some different uh, tips. We have a man of uh, 64 years old. He arrived at our attention for the recent onset of this neon effort. He has uh, hypertension and uh, hypercholesterolemia. His body mass index is uh, 28. So uh, he's treated with uh, ramipril and atorvastatin. Nothing to be remarkable at uh, the biohumoral markers and his uh, EKG is normal. At ECO, uh, we find an uh, ejection fraction of uh, 55%, but uh, there is an hypokinesia in the proximal lateral wall with a mild mitral insufficiency. He was submitted to an exercise stress test and uh, the, he reached a rate pressure product at a peak of uh, uh, 28,000, uh, so it's uh, quite normal, uh, without uh, ST abnormalities, uh, symptoms, or arrhythmias. So um, we decided to submit him uh, to a myocardial perfusion scan uh, with an exercise stress test in order to define if there is the presence of inducible ischemia. And um, here we have the final results of the scan. Um, in order to read the myocardial perfusion scintigraphy, you need to know that uh, we can acquire uh, two different types of scan after stress and at rest, and we need to compare each slices uh, in the two different conditions in order to evaluate the perfusion abnormalities during stress and uh, if present at rest. We have uh, three different types of slices, uh, the short axis slices uh, from the apex to the uh, um, uh, mitral plane, and uh, here we have the vertical axis from the septal wall to the lateral wall, and here we have the horizontal axis from the inferior wall to the anterior wall. So it's very simple to read. Uh, in order to have uh, something more uh, simple uh, for uh, uh, the first look, we can uh, uh, have this kind of evaluation. You can imagine your uh, left ventricle like an umbrella. If you open the umbrella, you have a 2D representation. In the middle, there is a hepex. Here you have the septal wall, anterior wall, lateral wall, and inferior wall in the two conditions, after stress and at rest. Uh, it's very uh, simple to read in this case because here we have a big area of uh, perfusion abnormality here in the um, territory of the uh, left circumflex artery, or uh, if you prefer, in the lateral wall. And if you analyze the bullseye at rest, you can find there is a, a quite normal situation in the middle and the distal portion of the LCX, while there is uh, the persistence of uh, perfusion abnormalities in the proximal part of the LCX. Uh, the same uh, results uh, is here uh, in the uh, lateral wall. You can find there is a big area. This is the same that you have in the bullseye, obviously, here with a, a quite normal reperfusion at rest. So it's a really very, very simple to read, and also here. So we have the first uh, issue, so the presence of perfusion abnormalities at the stress in the LCX territory, a big area of perfusion abnormalities with a, a quite completely normal reperfusion at rest. But it's not enough because uh, we can uh, quantify in a semi-quantitative way these perfusion abnormalities with uh, the um, with a software, very simple software that analyzes uh, the amount of perfusion abnormalities compared to the uh, peak of tracer uptake in one of the segment of the uh, 17 segment of the seg the. Uh, uh, 
uh, bullseye. And uh, here we found that uh, in this case, the summit stress score is uh, uh, 16, that is uh, more than 10% of the left ventricle, and the SRS, summit rest score, so the uh, summit score in each segment that we obtained at rest, this three, and the defect score in this case is 12. So it's a, a big amount of uh, uh, reversibility uh, in presence of uh, 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 minimal um, uh, absence of viability in the proximal portion of uh, uh, the LCX territory. So we have the uh, not normal viability presence of um, probably a minimum area of uh, necrosis uh, here in the proximal portion of the um, LCX. If you think that uh, this is associated with uh, uh, an hypokinesia uh, detected at ECO, probably we are not a real necrosis, but that compromises viability in this case. And what about the situation in the gated spect? So the gated spect here, if you say, here we have the possibility to detect the lateral wall. You see at, at after stress, after 15 minutes from the end of uh, the stress and here at rest. So there is also a, a reduction uh, of the kinases in the lateral wall after stress, even if uh, the uh, global ejection fraction is quite uh, the same. Uh, if you analyze the evaluation of the diastolic function represented by in spec by the peak filling rate, here you have that the normal uh, diastolic evaluation is around 2.1. And uh, we are we are in the in the limbus. Uh, it's uh, not completely normal, but it's not uh, completely abnormal. So, but it's uh, something that uh, could be taken into account uh, when you uh, think uh, about the risk of this patient. So we have presence of perfusion abnormalities in the uh, LCX territories associated with uh, a decrease of the kinases in the lateral wall. Remember. Okay. I need to put to your attention on uh, a specific issue. The, uh, we have a uh, lot of patients after myocardial infarction who have functional uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, this is uh, um, due to an adverse left ventricular remodeling uh, that causes a restricted leaflet motion and also regional left ventricular systolic dysfunction may play a role. So you need to evaluate uh, all these factors in order to detect if there is uh, an abnormality during your cardiac imaging evaluation that could be of help for clinicians for understand better this mitral regurgitation. And so you need to define ischemia, volumes, mass, presence of viability or necrosis, where? Uh, in the territory where you have the papillary muscle, and in particular in uh, the lateral wall where there is uh, the bigger papillary muscle. Also because uh, the choice of treatment in this patient can vary uh, in a very big way uh, if you uh, think that only half of the patient have an improvement in mitral regurgitation, for example, after revascularization by uh, CABG. So you need to understand uh, a little bit better uh, this kind of uh, mechanism and this kind of variable when you uh, examine your, uh, uh, for example, your stress scan or uh, your stress echo or your stress MRI. And why? This is uh, uh, very simple to understand if you analyze this MRI, because uh, this is the distance that you have in a normal situation, and this is the distance that you have in an abnormal situation between the two papillary muscles. So in this case, where there is a, a previous myocardial infarction, 
the distance between the two capillary muscle is increased, so you have the possibility to have a mitral regurgitation. So it's a functional mitral regurgitation, but it's very important to understand where there is the necrosis, if there is an inducible ischemia that can uh, uh, have an impact in this mitral regurgitation. So it's very important to analyze the size, the extension of, and the site of, of your ischemia and uh, necrosis in this case. This is another way to represent uh, uh, your papillary muscle, and it's very simple to analyze the correspondence with the uh, territories in terms of uh, uh, LCX, LAD, and so on. So really very, very important. And uh, only one other thing, here you have uh, a very nice uh, published study by uh, Volo and colleagues who analyzed the site of ischemia and the site of uh, uh, necrosis in terms of uh, myocardial perfusion scan and the impact uh, in terms of mitral regurgitation. And you see that the prevalence of mitral regurgitation in the stress perfusion spec is associated with the a perfusion defect in the anterior or anterolateral wall, where the uh, prevalence of mitral regurgitation in the rest perfusion defect is associated with a rest perfusion defect in the inferior wall. So uh, very simple to, uh, to understand. You need to uh, think about it in front of uh, your scan. So it's a regional hypothesis that is uh, obviously uh, related to the geometry of your ventricle. So when you report at the end your myocardial perfusion scan, you need to have in front of you and you need to uh, report also the clinical information of your patient, uh, the indication and uh, why uh, you have to perform this myocardial perfusion scan, the type of study protocol that you have done, so stress, uh, exercise stress test, treadmill stress test, um, or a vasodilator stress test, the results that you obtained from the analysis, the visual and semi-quantitative analysis of your uh, myocardial perfusion scan in terms of uh, perfusion and function, and then the interpretation and the conclusion. So if you remember our patient, here we have in front of a patient of 64 years old uh, with the recent concept of uh, dyspnea without uh, an amnestic data related to the, the dyspnea, but we have also an echo with an hypokinesis of the proximal lateral wall. And in this myocardial perfusion scan, we have a big amount of uh, inducible ischemia in the LCX territory with a uh, um, minimal area of uh, um, compromisation of viability. And uh, uh, so there is also the presence of stunning after stress uh, in the LCX territory. So at the end, we need to evaluate all this information and we can say that in our patient, we have a big area of ischemia in the LCX territory associated with this regional stunning in the same territory without a big area of necrosis in the LCX, but probably of a, a reduction of viability in the proximal part of the LCX territory. And we have in presence of normal ejection fraction at stress and at rest with normal volumes. So all this information are mandatory in order to define better the rule of myocardial scintigraphy in order to help clinician in their clinical decision making. So tips, you need to consider the overall extension of scar and viable myocardium for determining in this case, the global remodeling. In a perfusion study, you need to consider the inferior scar and lateral ischemia as determinants of regional remodeling for the presence of mitral regurgitation. In a perfusion study, you need to consider also the volume, the mass, and the diastolic function. And uh, if you are in presence of uh, previous myocardial infarction, please be sure that uh, uh, 
there is uh, the administration of nitrates before the rest study in order to maximize the extension of viability. Hoping that uh, it could be of help. Thank you very much for your attention.